At the end of our last study in chapter 1, we concluded with Paul writing to Timothy. If you would look at verses 18 through 20, Paul writes and says, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. Verse 20, chapter 1, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, it seemed to be, if you were with us last week, and if you were, were not, it seemed to be, just so that we're all on the same page, that this was a major side note to the issues that Timothy was dealing with in the church there in Ephesus. There were these men that were apparently causing some kind of major problems in the church, so much to the extent that Paul had to deal with them in a very harsh manner. Yet, I like you to note the heart of this, because often in times of correction, and even if somebody has made a major, major mistake or has done something very seriously wrong, we find that the heart of the Lord is restoration, not annihilation. And even in this particular case that we're reading of, of Alexander and Hymenaeus, uh, we see that in spite of the serious corrective measures that Paul took, he writes now in chapter 2, verse 1, therefore. So therefore, which you know if you've studied the Bible, therefore is a bridge word, a word that unites two different connecting thoughts. And so what we could read this as, and I'd like you to kind of picture with me is, you know, if, the, if Paul was writing to you instead of Timothy, as for us as Christians today, uh, determining how we can fulfill the will of the Lord, this could be read as Timothy. Because of what happened to him and Aeus and Alexander, watch yourself. Hold fast to your faith and to your good conscience. So what you see happening in somebody else's life that was very terrible, I want you, because of these things, I want you to hold fast to your faith. I want you to maintain a good and clear conscience before the Lord. This could also be read, Timothy, pray for them. Yes, even them. And this is how we segue into verse 1 in the thought here that Paul is communicating. He says, therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Verse 4, 1 Timothy 2 who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, verse 7, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubt, without doubting. Let's pray. Father, we ask, Lord, as we hop into this passage of Scripture today, that you would give us ears to hear what your Spirit would like to communicate to your, tr to your church, Lord, through the truth of your word. We ask, Lord, for your blessing to be added to the reading and to the study of your word. We ask, Lord, that you would mold us and shape us into the men and women that you have created us to be. And we ask for these things in Jesus' name, and we all say, amen. So, therefore, I exhort first. I want you to hold on to those words as we start this new section today. And just pause for a moment. Because prayer is what we're going to be looking at today. Prayer is not a priority for most people that are in the church. 
You know, and honestly, you know, pastors have, have really beaten this to death where, you know, in, in one way, shape, or form, they'll say something to the effect that, you know, if, if I uh, put on a, a potluck, then everybody shows up. And if I put on a prayer meeting, you won't find a living soul. And, and in some way or shape or form, as I mentioned, that this has been communicated that prayer meetings are the least attended meetings of the church. And you wonder why that is. How is that even possible? If prayer is such a, a dynamically, you know, important part of our relationship with the Lord, why is prayer so underutilized? Why is it really not taken very seriously? You know, I think if we're honest with ourselves as Christians, we could admit that we don't pray enough. We don't pray enough. And if you're like me, maybe you have, upon hearing me say, hey, we don't pray enough, there's a natural defense mechanism that insulates ourselves when we hear that we're not doing something enough. We'll say something to the effect like, uh, well, you know, I, you know, we could all pray more, couldn't we? Couldn't we? We could all do something better or all do something more. And we think that that's okay. You know, what if I said as the pastor of the church that I don't pray enough? Would it make you feel that you're off the hook? Because you're like, well, man, if the pastor's not praying enough, then, you know, then I'm okay. How would that make you feel? Paul encourages Timothy to pray. He previously, in chapter 1, if you remember, he had encouraged Timothy to teach sound doctrine, to preach the gospel, and what? To defend the faith. And right off the bat, the first things first, he says, pray. This word first means this is your starting point, Timothy. For you and me as Christians, this is your starting point to pray. This is where you start with the first things first. Because if you've ever been faced with a problem, if you've ever found yourself in a difficult situation, the first thing that you want to do is to hop in and fix it, to handle it, to deal with it. You know, what do I need to do to make this right? So, In this church in Ephesus, Timothy was dealing with a lot of problems. But Paul is saying, before you hop in to start dealing with these different things that you're going to have to deal with, the very first thing that you need to do is to pray. Now, I'm not sure where your personal prayer life fits into this statistic, but Christians are known to pray three times a day, seven days a week. And that's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Lord, bless this food and nourish it to our bodies. And at least we're consistent, for the most part, with praying over our meals. At our very first prayer meeting before our church started, I read this quote, and I'm going to share, with, share it with you today. It's from Ian Bounds, and he says this, and I quote, What the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more novel methods but men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. End of quote. Prayer is that instantaneous connection with Almighty God, the creator of the universe. Abraham Lincoln, and I shared one of his quotes yesterday, which he was actually quoting Jesus, but this one seems to be of his own where Abraham Lincoln says, and I quote, I've been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of all about me seemed insufficient for the day, end of quote. Even Abraham Lincoln would exhaust his own resources and then find himself in need of prayer. Paul goes to Timothy and tells you and me today through the living word of God that before you try to exhaust your resources, go to the Lord in prayer. In Luke chapter 18, verse 1, from the Holman Christian Study Bible, it says, Jesus then told his disciples a parable on the need for them to pray always and not become discouraged. To pray at all times. And to not become discouraged, to be wearied out or to be exhausted. Every single time without fail that I sit down and I say, I am going to pray. And I'm going to put this list together of things and I'm going to pray over that. This is me personally in my own prayer life. Every single time I set 
a time to pray. I have distraction upon distraction upon distraction. And it's not even the external things. It's my own thoughts. When you're trying to sit there quietly before the Lord and focus on prayer, it just seems like you get bombarded with all of these things that are meant to to get you off track. I wonder if any of you can relate to that. How that maybe praying for more than 10 seconds is a real difficult task. How sitting down and trying to enter in and to push into that spiritual place of communion with Lord, of the Lord is met by roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. Maybe that's why we get discouraged. Maybe that's why, you know, we'll throw up a quick prayer and nothing happens immediately and so we just stop praying. Jesus told his disciples that they need to always pray in the good, in the not so good, in the really bad. To continue to stay connected to the Lord. When you feel like praying, you should pray. And when you don't feel like praying, you should especially pray. If you want to jot something down, I would say, Write this down. There is such power in prayer. And if you don't have power in your life, it's because you don't have prayer in it either. You know, all the time we hear of Christians, I feel like I'm weak or I feel like I'm not, you know, making any headway. I'm not progressing and I'm not maturing and I'm not going forward. If you feel, if you see in your own life that you do not have power Spiritual power in your life, it's because you don't have prayer in it either. See, when we pray, it combats discouragement. Because we all wrestle with discouragement. Remember from our earlier studies in this letter of Paul's to Timothy, how you can pick one of two things. You can pick disobedience or you can pick discouragement. Which one are you going to choose? Because if Satan can't get you through disobedience to God, he's going to try to get you discouraged in your obedience to him. And we do get discouraged. We do wrestle with things that are are very hurtful, that are very perplexing, that are very draining. They're negative. They, They make us feel exhausted, weary, worn out. But when we pray, it combats discouragement. When you push through the physical limitations and distractions and you actually enter in, if you will, to the Holy of Holies, that communion place with God, when all the noise starts to just sound like ambience, and there you are communicating with God, there is such power that the Lord endues us with. Because when we sit alone by ourselves, when we focus on the enormity of our situation, we become depressed, really not because of the situation, but because we're focusing no longer upon God, but rather we're focusing upon ourselves. Clinically, the number one cause for depression is self-focus. And when we're focusing on ourselves, when we're focusing on our problems and not on the Lord, we have no other place to go than discouragement. But the best thing to refocus, our focus is to pray. And you'll find that depression, discouragement, the anxiety, the fear are all blurred out of the picture. You know, years ago, I shared this story in our Why series on why pray or why prayer in the church or in our lives as Christians. And I think it's worth repeating here. And it says, in its early days, the Dallas Theological Seminary, there in Texas, DTS as it's known today, was in critical need of $10,000 to keep the work going. During a prayer meeting, renowned Bible teacher Harry Ironside, a lecturer at the school, prayed, Lord, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. Will you please sell some of those cattle to help meet this need? And shortly, the story goes on that after that prayer meeting, a check for exactly the amount that they needed. $10,000 arrived at the school, and it was actually sent days earlier by a friend who had no idea of the urgent need or of Ironside's prayer. And this man simply noted that that the money came 
from the sale of some of his cattle. Lord, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. Would you mind selling a few head? And who put it upon the heart of this rancher to sell some of his cattle that would further the work of that school? But back to what we're looking at today, praying for those who have harmed you, praying for those who have wronged you, praying for those that have caused you grief. You remember what I said that in verse 1 of chapter 2, the word therefore connects what we read at the end of verses 18, 19, and 20 of chapter 1 with what Paul would say to Timothy in chapter 2. He ended off with Hymenaeus and Alexander, these men that have caused great grief in the church. People that have caused major problems, that have acted wickedly. They were blasphemers. And Paul tells Timothy, pray. You know, I used to hear all the time when I was a kid, and I grew up in a Christian home, but there comes a point when you have to decide for yourself as your own man what you're going to believe. And I used to hear all the time because I had gone through some very, you know, terrible, painful, difficult things in my high school years. And I remember, you know, hearing, uh, you know, my pastor, my parents say, well, you know, you need to pray for those people that have wronged you. You need to pray for those that have hurt you. And I thought to myself, yeah, you know, I'll pray all right. Sure, I'll pray that bad things happen to those people. I'll pray that God smites them. You know, there's a huge significance in the spiritual realm when you pray for someone that has wronged you. Number one, if I might just point out to you, and I know this from personal experience, that when you pray for somebody that has hurt you or has wronged you, and not praying that a house falls on them or they have early transmission failure or whatever else may come to your mind in your flesh, but when you actually pray with the heart of the Lord for somebody that has wronged you, you actually are exemplifying the heart of God for those who have done wrong in your prayer life. Your prayer life is now pleasing to the Lord because you're praying with the heart of the Lord. Secondly, number two, when you pray for those that have wronged you, it genuinely, certifiably protects your heart from bitterness, resentment, and sin. Because the natural response of mankind when we have been wronged is to hate that person, to despise that per person, or at the very best, dislike them. But what if they're in the church? What if they called themselves a Christian? What if they were a friend? But as my spiritual man intervenes in my physical, emotional state, where I have my emotions that are directed in a negative way towards that person who has wronged me, when my spiritual man, my spiritual life intervenes, I will find and have found that I have a much harder time being angry and bitter towards that person when I am praying for them. Conversely, I will find that I have a far more difficult time not being consumed by my anger towards them if I am not praying for them. And I've been on both sides of that fence. But I can tell you, and I'm living proof, that the Bible is true because I have seen people that were my enemies, people that I knew when I was younger that I said, one day you will get yours by my hand. And I had seen firsthand the Lord change that person's life as he brought them to a saving knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ. And I was able to see and connect with that person years down the road. The person that I had told myself as a young man that if I ever see that guy, he's going to get what's coming to him. And you know what was interesting? Not only had the Lord changed his life, the Lord had changed my life. I didn't have any feelings of hatred or animosity. I had no anger towards this man. And I found that the Lord is true to his word. And if you're looking at the real life context of real life church and even what is really precedented here in the scriptures today, that you will find that we're to pray for all men, even those that cause us harm. And Paul lists out now the types of prayer that are to be made and how we can grow in our prayer life, which I think we all need to do. He says, I exhort, 
First of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings, verse 2, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. So in light of this, would you please join with me as we pray? Father in heaven, we come before you today in obedience to your word. As uncomfortable as it may be in our flesh at times, as we have completely different worldviews from the ones that we pray for at times, we understand your heart. We understand that you've come to seek and to save that which was lost. So Lord, we pray for the President of the United States, Joe Biden. We pray, Lord, for the Vice President, Kamala Harris, and all the way down. We pray, Lord, that you would minister to these two. Lord, that you would bring them to a saving knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, for the wicked things that are being done, Lord, that they would stop and that righteousness would take its place. Father, we ask, God, that your spirit would move in the White House. We ask, Lord, in all of the camps of the enemy, Lord, that your spirit would move. It is not limited. It is not held back. Lord, you are at work in the world today. And so we pray for our president. We pray for our vice president. Even for those of us that say, well, they're not my president, not my vice president. Lord, we live in this country, and we're called to pray for all kings and those that are in authority. We pray for our governor, Gavin Newsom, that he would come to know you. We pray, Lord, that you would please have your hand of conviction and direction and wisdom. Lord, be upon him. And Lord, we pray that he would come to a saving knowledge of who Jesus is. Lord, we pray over our county, our supervisors. We pray over our mayor, Mayor Khan. We pray over the school district, the board of supervisors in Tustin and in Irvine. And we ask, Lord, that you would please have your Holy Spirit at work in each of these agencies. Lord, we ask, Father, that we be obedient to your word. And Lord, I ask that you would help us instead of cringing, that we would have your heart, and that we would continue to lift up our leaders, the leadership of our country, of our state, of our county, and our cities. And Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And in the Bible here, we see at least seven different Greek nouns that are used to describe the English word for prayer. And four of those seven, seven different uses Seven different descriptions of our word prayer, they're found in this passage. And the first one being supplication. And so if you would like to grow in your prayer life, here's how you can do it. The first thing that we see here is supplication. This is offering a request for a felt need. This is a personal request of your own. Prayers is the next word that is listed. And most, it's the most common that we see found in the scriptures, but it's an, emphasis, it's an emphasizing of the sacredness of praying to the Lord as an act of worship. That we pray to the Lord and commune with the Lord and have fellowship with the Lord, and it's a sacred, holy thing. Thirdly, we see Paul lists this word called, or named intercessions, this type of prayer where we're praying on another's behalf. We're interceding on behalf of someone else that's in need. So a prayer for myself. Communion where I'm just talking with the Lord, which you can. Prayer for someone else. And then lastly, number four, the giving of thanks. This is the praising and thanking of God. You know, there's really something unique to be said about the individual and the church that takes hold of these four things in their prayers where we ask for our own needs. We communicate with the Lord in a holy manner. We intercede on behalf of others and we praise the Lord. Paul is instructing Timothy that the church should be doing this. The church should be doing this. Not just the pastor. Not just Timothy here. You know, it might be the pastor's job. Yeah, of course. But it's actually the church's job. And to do so publicly. 
We want to continue to be known as a supplicating church, a, a prayerful church, an interceding church, and a thankful church. In the context of Paul's background, prayer for the Jew was extremely important. One of their prayers was the Shema. and was prayed twice a day in the morning and the night, and it was comprised of three sections of the Old Testament scriptures, beginning with Deuteronomy 6, which says, The Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, with all thy might and with all thy strength. And then three times a day at 9 a.m., at 12 noon, and at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, the Shimonoff was 18 separate prayers. And then you started to see this regression and that prayers became more of a routine, sort of like how we pray for our meals. Lord, bless this food, nourish it to our bodies in Jesus' name, amen. And we pray subconsciously. You know, we don't even have to think about it. We just rattle it off. You know, one famous Jewish prayer began like this, and I quote, blessed, praised, and glorified, exalted, and honored, magnified, and lauded be the name of the Holy One. And often we can throw in as many different adjectives as we can. But in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2, Solomon wrote and said, Do not be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven, and you on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. So often we use filler words, vocalized pauses. We pray things that don't even make any sense at times. Warren Wearsby wrote, and I quote, The Pharisees prayed in order to be praised by men or to impress other worshipers. True Christians pray in order to please God. End of quote. You know, in the early church, one of the early church fathers by the name of Tertullian explained this, and I'd like to share with you another quote because I think it brings us right to where we are today, where he says, we pray for all the emperors, that God may grant them long life, a secure government, a prosperous family, vigorous troops, a faithful senate, an obedient people, that the whole world may be in peace, and that God may grant both to Caesar and to every man the accomplishment of their just desires. End of quote. So we'll pray evangelistically for evil rulers and those that practice and support wickedness. Verse two, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may li live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. Listen to what Proverbs 29 verse two says. When the godly are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked are in power, they groan. So we can, as the church, of course, pray for righteous rulers, and even better yet, pray for the unrighteous rulers that they might be saved and that we might add a brother or sister to the family. And why are we to pray in such a manner? Why are we to pray in a way that goes against our natural feelings? Well, because it says in verse 3 that this is a good and acceptable thing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. If somebody mistreats us, if somebody is saying terrible things about us, all it really is is showing you what their heart is like. It might even be showing you very clearly their need for a savior. Pray for all mankind, God says, because he desires all mankind to be saved. And really that's the message of the gospel that God asks his people to pray for those who do not know him so that they might come to the knowledge of the truth. Because God desires that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The guy that cuts you off at the freeway, the grumpy clerk at the grocery store, you know, that one person at your job, whoever it may be, the one that backstabbed you or slandered you or whatever, you're to pray for that person. 
that they come to know Jesus. And it says in verse 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So there's only one way, according to God, that anyone might be saved from their sin, and that is through faith alone in Jesus Christ. And as we look at the history of prayer and as it's instituted, the most holy place in the temple was separated by a huge veil. A huge veil. It was so thick and so heavy and so tall and so wide. No one could pass through that except at the appointed time by the high priest. In Exodus 26, verse 33, it says, And you shall hang the veil from the clasps, and you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there, behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. This was the inner sanctum where God dwelled, where the high priest would communicate with God. You know, when you prayed to the Lord as one of the priests of Israel, you never said things like, the big man upstairs, the big guy. You didn't show up unprepared or unclean or just at any time you felt like it. In Leviticus chapter 16, verse 2, and it says, The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Hey, you don't just show up or you'll be struck down dead. There was a sincere reverence for God when you interacted with him. Then after a long line of judges, the kings of Judah and of Israel, the prophets, the captivity, and the temple destroyed by the Babylonians, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was born on the earth. And there he was, nailed to the cross as he laid down his life for the sins of the world. And listen to what Mark records in chapter 15, verses 37 through 39. It says, And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple, the one that I read to you in Exodus and Leviticus, then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood by opposite Jesus saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. The barrier that separated man from the most holy place from intimacy with God was torn from top to bottom. God rended it apart. The veil that separated the most holy God from sinful man was removed by the death of Jesus on the cross. And the implications of the veil being torn are astounding. Because man, you, me, we would no longer be separated from God because of our sins. We would have direct and personal communication with God through faith in Jesus the one mediator between God and man. And from that personal connection and access to God, Paul writes in verse seven, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Salvation is the end result. And the means to that end is prayer and the preaching of the gospel, and the teaching of the Bible. That's why your church, this church is committed to teach the Bible, committed to teaching the whole counsel of God. When a lot of things are going sideways, and we talk about this with our leadership, we prayed over it with the guys, we want to be a church that when things go sideways, you will always know what God's word says. And I've told you before that if I ever tell you something and start teaching you contradictory, something contradictory to what God's word says, you're to run, you know, for the Orchard Hills. Get out of here. This is a very important part of what Paul is writing to Timothy and what we're looking at as a church today. Because prayer and the work of the ministry are both based upon the sacrificial work of Jesus on the cross. And they're both vitally important. So I desire, therefore, 
verse 8, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. What Paul is writing here to this young pastor, Timothy, in this church found in a wicked city called Ephesus, was a call for the men to lead. A call for the men to be godly men. For the men to be spiritual leaders. And he says specifically here, I desire that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. One thing I've noticed over the years, that it's the women that pray everywhere. The women are the prayer warriors. The women are praying all over the place all the time. I don't know what it is about women, but they pray and they pray some more. But where are the men? On average, there are more women that pray regularly than men do. Now, is this because women like to talk more than men do? I'm not sure, but I'm sure there's an exception to every rule. But this encouragement here is for men to pray. Lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting, for men are to represent the church in the throne room of God. They're to lead the church, to lead culture into meeting the Lord. Showing by example what it means to communicate with the Almighty God. Showing what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus, what it means to be on fire for him, to do the things that are difficult, to push through and charge the gates of hell in the name of Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit. But where are the men? Why don't we pray? Why are we more naturally inclined to use our own abilities and use our own resources? To tackle things without praying first, Paul tells Timothy, pray first, then go tackle the day. Pray, seek me. And as I mentioned earlier, if you find yourself without prayer, without power in your life, it's because prayer's not in it either. And this should be a challenge to all men. Prayer. Now we can close our eyes when we pray. It can help us concentrate more, you know, than when we're looking around. I know when we were kids, we used to love, love to bust each other, you know, and say, oh, you weren't closing your eyes, you know, when you were praying. Well, how do you know? Oh, you know, closing our eyes can help us. Bowing our heads can be used in prayer. So can looking up or even falling face first on the floor as you cry out to God. The folding of hands actually, as we pray, and you've seen the, you know, the, the, the little kids depicted in different storybooks and things with the folding of hands is actually an oriental custom. When the Jews prayed, they prayed with their hands up and open because it said that they expected to receive something from the Lord. I wonder how often we pray expecting to receive something from the Lord or to hear from him. Or are we so easily distracted? Or do we become weary after praying for something one time? Yet even as we can have different postures in praying before the Lord, the most important posture is the condition of our heart. And Paul lists it off and says, holy hands, clean hands, hands not given to practicing wickedness. If I'm in sin, my prayers will be hindered. Now granted, not the prayer of salvation or forgiveness, but as I'm desiring to enter into the spiritual place of really praying, I need to repent of my sin. I need to cleanse my hands. In James 4.8, James writes and says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You know, last night I was able to join my friend Ryan Reese and do the radio show, talk show that he does, and we talked about having the power of the Holy Spirit and how sin can hold you back so terribly from walking in power as a Christian. But James 4, 8 says, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. So he says, pray. Men, be pure. Men, be holy. 
And it says, be without wrath, which means without being angry at someone. Interesting that we're to pray without being mad at someone at all. Wrath towards another person hinders our prayers. If you're mad at a brother or sister in the Lord, maybe they're causing problems, maybe they're not behaving themselves. If you're mad at your spouse or at your children, your prayers will be hindered. Jesus said to this end in Matthew 5, verses 23 and 24 in his Sermon on the Mount, he says, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. I have to check myself. I don't want my prayers to be hindered. I want to be praying according to the scriptures. And if I find that I'm in sin of some sort, if we find that we have wrath towards somebody, then our prayers are not going to be what they should be. And thirdly, he says that we're to pray without doubting. This is the hardest thing for Christians to do. We might be able to repent of our sin, ask God to forgive us. We might go down the list and be like, nope, I'm not at odds with anybody. But then here's the real kicker, to pray without doubting. Pray without doubting. How often have we prayed for someone that's in need and laid our hands upon them and said, Lord, I know that you can do all things. Lord, would you please minister to this person right now and do the impossible? Lord, would you work right now? And in the back of our minds, we think to ourselves, man, this is a long shot. And it happens simultaneously as we're praying. We're praying for someone, but there's something in the back of our head saying, ah, that's, I don't know if that's gonna happen. Well, good luck with that. Pray without doubting, he says. And again, in James chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, it says, Let him who prays ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. I don't want to be unstable in any of my ways. I want the power of the Holy Spirit at work in my life. Very simply, as we conclude with prayer, and we'll observe communion today being the first Sunday of the month, more prayer equals more power. No prayer, no power. When we pray, something happens in the heavenlies. When we pray again and again and again and again, why do you think Jesus encouraged his, encouraged his disciples to pray at all times and not be discouraged? Because the enemy wants to discourage you in being obedient to the Lord in your prayer life, in your prayer time. Don't be surprised that praying for your family in the morning may bring on a chaotic episode of some sort. Don't be surprised that when you sit down and try to pray sincerely and intercede, that thoughts come in to distract you. We must be prayer warriors. We must pray at all times. And I encourage you and I ask you to join with me in committing to praying, to pray for one another, to pray for your family, to pray for your church, to pray for your community and your city, and to make it a habit that you do it regularly, that you do it at all times. If prayer wasn't a big deal, why would Satan try to discourage us from doing it so often and immediately? If prayer wasn't so important and so connected to the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our life, why would there be so much opposition to our prayer life? It doesn't make sense to me. And if you have any bit of common sense, you would agree that it must actually mean something spiritually if the devil wants to keep me from doing it so badly.
Do you want to have your own stories of God's faithfulness? Or do you want to just hear of other people's? Do you want to have your own stories of God working miraculously, or do you want to just read and hear about other people's? Wow, that's so cool, that story. Man, what they shared, wow, that's mind-blowing, how God worked like that. You can have those own, you can have your own personal experiences. Pray and seek the Lord. Step out in faith. Draw near to the Lord, and he'll draw near to you. Pray like you've never prayed before. Set a reminder on your phone. Put a post-it on your bathroom mirror. Pray because there's power in prayer. Would you please join with me as we pray? Father, we thank you for this great privilege of praying that right now, Lord, you are listening to the prayer of our hearts. This very moment, Lord, you know my thoughts. You know our thoughts afar off. You know the words we speak before we even speak them. Even right now, Lord, you know the needs of us as individuals, as a family, and as a church before we even were aware of those needs. And so, Lord, we come to you humbly and boldly approaching the throne of grace, your throne of grace, and we're asking that you would do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond anything we could ever ask or imagine. Fill us overflowing with your Holy Spirit. Give us boldness as lions. Lord, may we not be discouraged when we're not seeing your work take place. It's happening, and by faith, Lord, we know faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And Lord, we thank you. Thank you that we have been given access that we have been given salvation through Jesus. Through what he did for us on the cross, as the veil was torn in two from top to bottom, that which separated man was now removed, separated man from you, Lord, was removed. As Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him. We remember that today as we observe communion. And Lord, would you bless your people, bless your church, and Father, we thank you for the great work that you have done here today. We thank you, Lord, for moving by the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the peace that is upon this place. Thank you, Lord, that where your spirit is, there is unity. Thank you that we're united as the body of Christ today here in the city of Irvine. Father, I ask that you would continue to move in our hearts. May we be conformed to your will. May we be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And may every day we live be lived as a life bringing honor and glory to you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And one last thing that I wanted to announce, and I didn't provide a sign-up sheet for this, but if men, you felt moved today by what's required of, in this case specifically, for the men to be involved with as men who pray, and you like to be a part of our men's prayer chain that we're gonna be starting today, that after service today, that you would head over and sign up on the men's sign-up and put down your email, and let's start praying like we've never prayed before and united. Uniting as the men of the church and as leaders, as warriors, and those who pray without being discouraged. We can pray over the needs of our church, the needs of our families, the needs of individuals, and we can see the Lord do great and mighty things. And I think we've just begun to see the great work that the Lord has in store for this church and for your life. But I believe it's gonna be brought about by not just men and not just women, 
but by the church stepping up and praying. So may the Lord bless you today. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace as you worship the Lord and are sent out your way today, walking in the spirit. God bless you and have a great rest of your Sunday. And let's close with a song.